All right, so last but not least, let's talk about Scrum. Uh, Scrum is also an agile method and it's one that's focused more on the management aspects of, of things. Um, so it's kind of a contradiction because it's been designed to, to allow management and structured management of iterative development processes, which is in its own kind of yeah a contradiction let's call it like this um the important thing to note is in my opinion that even though scrum is focused more in the management aspects and uh, extreme programming which we talked about previously is focused more on the uh, programming and development aspects that absolutely doesn't mean that you can't mix the two so in fact there's no rule that you can must strictly keep to one specific agile method you can just basically pick the parts uh, you like for your own process and mix and match them as you see fit basically. Um, all right, but so the fundamental idea behind Scrum is uh, that it's kind of designed to, to make doing agile processes easier in general. And so we have three phases. There's one outline phase, which is kind of like the, the planning phase in the traditional waterfall model, but which is very, very high level. Then we have the sprint, so-called sprint cycles. And last but not least, we have a, a closure, which is doing wrap up and documentation. And each of these sprint cycles is very much like a release in extreme programming. Um, so there's kind of a, a bracket around the, uh, the agile process, which does a little bit of planning up and design up front at a high level and which does a wrap up with documentation and so on. And in each uh, sprint cycle, so-called sprint cycle, we have these four phases, um, assessment, selection, development, and review. Um, as I already mentioned, this roughly corresponds to one release in extreme programming. And so you can easily combine the two. Um, in the assessment phase, uh, the, the backlog of things to be done is, uh, is evaluated. Then the team together with the customer selects which um, features they want to implement in this cycle. Then the actual development uh, happens. And here the team is uh, not to be contacted by, by the customer and the rest. This is the, the job of the Scrum Master afterwards. I'll talk about that in a moment. And last but not least, there's a review phase and presentation of the current release to, to the stakeholders. So this is very similar to um, all the other iterative processes we talked about. One important aspect of Scrum, however, is the so-called Scrum Master. And this is kind of a facilitator. This usually isn't a developer on their own. Um, and their main tasks are to um, arrange a stand-up meeting every day. So this should be just uh, for something like 50 minutes so that everybody knows what the current state of the project is, basically. Um, the Scrum Master also keeps track of the current backlog and what's what's next to be done. If the team makes any decisions, then they kind of record that for the future. And the most important part actually is that the Scrum Master is the one person that communicates with the customers and the rest of the management. So uh, it's not possible that uh, somebody, uh, ideally at least, if Scrum is done properly, then it's not possible that somebody from upper management goes through to one of the developers and tells them to drop everything they're doing and implement this great new feature because the customer thinks it's great. Um, everything like that has to go through the Scrum Master and it also shouldn't happen in the middle of one sprint cycle. It only should happen uh, during the, the assessment phase, for example. So um, the team is actually isolated from, from external influences by the Scrum Master. And this is generally a good thing because it uh, uh, keeps the project usually flowing along much more smoothly. And another important job of the Scrum Master is also to arrange these daily stand-up meetings. So where everybody really briefly describes what they want to do for the day and where everyone knows about um, what the others are doing too. And so if somebody is stuck on something and they mention that in the um, in the stand-up meeting, even if it's just one sentence, then somebody else can basically chime in and tell them if they actually know the solution to that already. Um, 
then a lot of things can get solved much more quickly. Another important aspect of Scrum is to have these kind of Scrum board. Mm. This is used to track progress during each cycle. And here's a very nice example. So here, you, as you can see, this is just a whiteboard with, with a couple of labels and a bit of tape and lots of post-its. Uh, sometimes people also use digital versions of that. So you can have something very similar actually in GitHub. In GitHub, it's called projects, but it's it looks actually quite similar to this uh, to this board. And <clears throat> here you can see uh, each of the user stories. Then from each of the user stories, you get a couple of tasks. It's here it's three, here it's three. So it's usually three to, to five uh, tasks per user story. And then for each uh, user story that's been selected for the current release, the tasks are first put into the due to do column, of course, then when somebody starts working on them, they're moving to in progress, then perhaps there's a testing uh, column when things are already done and need to be integrated. And last but not least, if something is done, then here it ends, uh, it, it moves to the last column. And ideally, when the sprint is done, each the sprint cycle, then all of the posts have moved to the final column. And here, obviously, uh, as you can see, this is the dividing line between things that are um, on track for the current sprint cycle and things that have been postponed uh, for the future uh, or that uh, yeah have been put on hold maybe because t what, parts of them seem to be already done. So um, once again, there's not a strict rule book you have to follow to do Scrum. There's a couple of good practices you can use and using this sort of Scrum board, project board uh, is actually a, a very good idea to, to keep in mind for any sort of project. Um, Based on these uh, individual tasks and user stories, you can also create a so-called uh, burn down chart. If you have a digital tool for keeping track of the of the tasks and so on, then uh, this is usually uh, something that that di digital tool can actually generate for you. So here, when we start off with the sprint, um, we have a, a estimate for how much effort the remaining tasks will, will take. And as some tasks get completed, the effort goes down, of course. Sometimes it can also go up if the estimate changes, of course. Um, then there's a ideal line of how many things should be completed on average and of how many tasks are still remaining. Um, and as you can see at the beginning of the sprint, not a lot uh, gets completed, but then after a week or so, things start to pick up and then by the end, uh, quite a lot of tasks uh, get completed. So here we actually have a three week sprint th a cycle, as you can see, uh, 7, 14, 21 days. Um, this is also an option, of course. Uh, it entirely depends on your uh, your team preferences. And this, of course, uh, if you have a tool to generate this sort of uh, burn down chart, then you can always uh, get a, a good overview over the, the progress of the current uh, sprint cycle, just like with the scrum board um, we saw previously. It's not necessary to actually draw this if uh, you don't have a digital tool, but it still gives you a nice overview over the project, especially if you're in a, in a larger context. Um, this also brings me to the uh, topics of scaling ag agile methods. So there's two directions which you can scale them. One is to scale them up. That means uh, using agile meth methods for very large systems. So um, what's, what are the characteristics of large systems? Often we have uh, multiple subsystems that somehow communicate with each other. Then we also have uh, interaction or, or wrapping of other existing systems that we can't change. Sometimes we need to deal with, with specific regulations in the medical area, if we're doing something related to, to air travel and so on. Um, larger systems also have a, a longer time for, first of all, for procurement, then for the development itself. And usually they uh, also have a longer deployment time. And Last but not least, the number of stakeholders is higher. So um, whenever you have a combination of these uh, 
let's say two, three or more of these uh, things, then you can consider this to be a large system. And then it's maybe not a good idea to take one of the agile methods just as it is and apply, try to apply it because that might actually lead to, to more problems than it solves. So what approaches are possible to, to uh, develop large systems using agile methods? Uh, for one thing, you can just use multiple teams um, because the whole system is simply too large for one small team the kind of sweet spot of team size for agile methods is often assumed to be somewhere around 10 or at most 15 people. So if you have a really large system that requires 100 people, then you can't manage all of this as one agile team. Uh, you need to split it up. And that also means that you need to, to have a bit of architecture design up front, just like in Scrum, because otherwise if everybody starts just uh, programming, uh, every team starts off with whatever they like, then there's go not going to be a lot of, of success here. So we need at least to figure out the responsibilities for each team up front. Um, we also need the teams to communicate. If they're in the same building, of course, then you can have um, maybe something like a weekly meeting um, between the Scrum Masters. Um, or if you have distributed teams, then you need to use something like uh, uh, a group chat, or something like Slack, or maybe uh, regular Skype calls, maybe also something like a wiki to, to communicate and to also create documentation. So once again, a wiki is a good idea for that. Um, where just everybody keeps their notes and everybody else can look them, them up. And if uh, last but not least, if you have a really large system, then uh, it might actually not be possible to do continuous integration all the time. Um, so immediately test each commit, test each feature because um, the build time might uh, simply be too long. So one example is um, uh, Microsoft Windows. So you can, of course, build the whole of Windows from scratch, but that takes, even on a big Microsoft server farm, it takes something around 24 hours, I think. So if you would have to do that for every commit, then uh, of course you would never get any work done anymore. All right, so this was one direction of scaling agile methods for larger systems. Um, the other direction is called scaling them out. And that means uh, using agile methods in a, in a large company. And this is also possible, but there are other pitfalls. Even if you just are developing a small system with one agile team, then you can get um, issues with uh, the upper management because uh, in large companies, people are often very keen on having things they can measure and with an agile method there's not such a clear plan and such a clear progress uh, as with a, with a waterfall uh, method for example so there's quite a bit of reluctance to to kind of uh, use these open-ended methods then um, especially if you have a really large company like let's say Siemens or General Electric or whatever, then they actually have a lot of bureaucracy internally and they have their own procedures and their own regulations. And that also is quite quite difficult sometimes to, to reconcile with uh, agile methods. Then the larger the company is, the, the uh, more different skill levels you usually have in a team. So um, if you have a small startup, then it's quite common that you have a lot of uh, young and experienced uh, coders, for example, that are all more or less experts in the area they're working on. If you have a larger company, then you get people that have been reassigned from different parts of the company that may not actually be uh, experts in the in the um, specific software you're using, for example, or in the programming language that have to kind of learn on the job. So there's a lot more variance in skill. And this is also something that is more difficult to, to account for with agile methods. And last but not least, there's just a bit of cultural resistance. This is kind of passed down from the upper management. So uh, if the boss doesn't like the agile methods, then a lot of people on the on the lower levels of the hierarchy will also often uh, kind of resist this uh, this approach. So all of these things are something you have to 
kind of um, keep in mind when you want to to use agile methods within the context of of big companies for example all right so last but not least we're uh, at the end of this block so this was actually two regular lectures and the summary, I think, uh, in, in, in a nutshell, is that both the plan-driven methods and the agile methods have their merits. It's not like one is strictly better than the other. Um, and for both of them, if you take an example from a textbook that tells you this is how Scrum has to be done or this is how Waterfall uh, has to be done and so on, then in no matter if it's plan-driven or agile, it likely won't work as is uh, right now from the textbook it won't work like this in reality so you will have to adapt it to the specific circumstances you're dealing with so one size doesn't fit all this is really i think the one key message for these these last two uh, topic blocks all right, so yeah, thanks for listening, I guess. And once again, um, if there are any questions, anything unclear, uh, don't hesitate to post a message on Moodle and I'll be happy to, to go in a bit more detail on anything that's uh, that's still unclear. Thanks.